Hello, everyone. Good morning from, from Sweden. It's 9 a.m. here um, where we are. And my name is Johan Gunnarsson. I work at the Division of External Relations in the International Marketing and Recruitment Team. Uh, this week is our virtual application week, and we have already had many presentations, thematic and also more general, uh, about our subject areas and also how to make an application, etc. Today, we are hosting staff members from uh, Lund University Faculty of Science. Um, and I'm going to let them introduce themselves in a little moment. Uh, today, we are inviting all attendees who are joining us to ask questions related to our uh, bachelor's and master's degree programs in science at Lund University. So please try to keep it relevant for the uh, panelists if you can. Uh, my colleague Maria is in the background off camera answering questions as well in the Q&A uh, throughout this presentation. Um, so please take your questions to the Q&A and write them down and we'll discuss them uh, with the panelists. Now I think it's time to introduce our panelists and according to my screen, Lotta Persmark uh, is the first person who will make a self-introduction. Please Lotta. Okay, hi all. Uh, I'm Lotta uh, at the Department of Biology, uh, and I represent here the master's programs in bioinformatics in biology with uh, six specializations and uh, molecular biology uh, with four specializations. Okay, thank you. Yes, we have, we have a lot of programs in science, don't we, in Lund? <laughs> Many specializations. Uh, next on my screen, Don Hamalun from Geology. Yes, hello everybody. My name is Don Hamalun and I'm a geologist. So I represent the important and fascinating subject of planet Earth, the planet we live on. And then we have a two-year master's program in geology here with the three different specializations in bedrock geology and biogeology and quaternary geology but we have a lot of flexibility in our course, uh, elective courses and so on. Thank you, Don. Next on my screen, Carl Trueng. Yes, hello everyone. I'm Carl Trueng. I'm a researcher at the Department of Astronomy and Theoretical Physics, and I'm here representing the six different specializations in the uh, physics program. Uh, so I'm the coordinator of the biological one, uh, but there are other specializations more general or more specific in different uh, areas. Thank you, Paul. So we have biology, geology, physics, and now we move on to chemistry. Ola Vent. Uh, so my name is Ola Vent, and uh, I, I am here to talk about the master programs in chemistry. It's uh, two year master programs, and we have three specializations uh, synthetic and analytical chemistry, physical chemistry, and biochemistry. I would like to tell you also that I will have to leave at 9.45, so please post any questions before that, if you have that to me. Great, that's a good point. Thank you, Ulla. Yes, please, uh, participants, uh, visitors, use the Zoom Q&A to ask your questions about studying science at Lund University. Uh, last but not least, welcome back, Anna Maria. Nice to see you again. Thank you. So my name is Anna Maria Persson and I am an associate professor at the Department of Mathematics at the Faculty of Science and I am the coordinator of the bachelor's program in mathematics but also coordinator for the master program in mathematics and numerical analysis and I also represent the master program in mathematical statistics today. So welcome with your questions. All right, thank you, Anna Maria. Um, so we don't have a Q and A uh, question just yet, but I would like to ask the questions here a few things to get started because the Faculty of Science at Lund University is large. It's a, it's a big faculty. They, a lot of research is being conducted at the faculty as well. How does that influence the the master's degree programs that we have? Would anyone like to explain the connection between research? conducted and also the education that we are offering. Ola. Well, if I look at chemistry, first of all, it means that all the teachers in the, in the chemistry master are research active uh, professors uh, or lecturers, but uh, they are all research active. 
It also means that there is a very strong connection to the research, although, of course, the courses are based on, on uh, a more fundamental level. They usually uh, offer uh, insight into current research and also in the in the second year, when when students do uh, projects, they uh, most often do them in the research uh, groups of the department. How how do you become a member of such a group, or if, if, do you do you contact uh, researchers and teachers that you find oh their their research sounds very interesting and you contact yeah. them? Yeah. I mean, I think this, this I can probably speak for the whole uh, faculty in saying that there is a very close um, connection between students and teachers. I mean, we do not keep a, a big distance between students and teachers, and, and we try to, to have a very sort of um, close relationship. Uh, and uh, this means that you will get, as a student, you will get in contact with many teachers who are also researchers. And uh, talking to them, you will get insight into what kind of research is going on. And then uh, you can get in contact with the research group that you are interested in. You can, of course, also talk to, uh, for example, the director of studies to get, get help in, in finding a research group. But usually most students find a research group through the contacts via their teachers. Mm. Uh, Don, how am I learned that geology? Does it work uh, the same as the uh, Department of Chemistry? Yes, the same goes for us. We are a relatively small department and, and uh, our students usually get uh, well acquainted with our teachers. And, and uh, as, a, as a student, you always get to uh, get exposed to the different uh, uh, laboratories where we work and conduct our experiments. And, and we also have ample opportunities to provide uh, yeah, possibilities to, to do field work and, and, and participate in, in the research projects. So uh, this is typical for us, I think. And that's also a very close connection between uh, the teaching and, and the research activities. Mm. Uh, Carl, how does it work at, over at physics? Uh... Well, it's, it's much the same as, as Ulla described with the uh, students coming into contact with teachers through courses and so on. And uh, of course, since there are different divisions and we are two different departments that uh, do physics together, uh, there is the question of, you know, who do you get in contact with? Do you, you, do your, do you do this project on uh, one department or the other? And who do you do it with? But students find their way. Students talk to people, you know, they, they find projects they're interested in. Uh, and of course, they can also look at what projects we have had in the past, if they're interested in something specific. Uh, and then I think in general, also, just in the student-teacher contact, it's quite informal. I mean, it is very Swedish. There's, uh, it takes some time sometimes to uh, just train students in, in being as informal as we are. Uh, <laughs> and, you know, dropping the titles. And do, do they like that, Lotta, in your, your experience? The fact that it is a rather informal uh, uh, environment with a flat hierarchy, so to speak. Yeah, I think that's very uh, special for the bio. All students talk about that. We have to teach them uh, how to to connect to connect to to the professors, and we are not so formal. So that's very important. And uh, also, students can do projects or applied works during their uh, the first year, or just work extra with the. Start uh, the research groups, and uh, that's a very good way to get in contact and get uh, yeah get into the research groups and learn some extras uh, during their their coursework. Mm. Because most students say that yeah, doing project small projects and uh, the master thesis are the most important thing. That's where you really learn science. So it's 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 a bit it's, a, it's uh, and we have offered this huge amount of research groups so that most students can easily find a suitable project it's, it's very very important some some programs like the bioinformatics actually consist mainly of a uh, course a coursework but then mainly projects in different uh, research groups mm -hmm. 
Anna Maria uh, at mathematics, uh, does it work the same? It, I, I, I see a common common theme here from the other departments with uh, how, how students may approach uh, their teachers and researchers easily and uh, and maybe ask to be uh, participate in some way in ongoing research projects or uh, is, is it the same at mathematics? Yes, it is the same at our department as well. As Don said before, our department is also rather small, but we are part of um, a bigger center for mathematical sciences. So the Faculty of Science works alongside the Faculty of Engineer in Engineering, and we have uh, a lot of interactions between um, our division, so to say. Um, and regarding the students, they, are, they also have a lot of flexibility. Um, so they are welcome in the uh, pure mathematics area, but also in numerical analysis, statistics, and uh, they also have the opportunity to take applied courses and so on. And um, when it comes to this informal atmosphere and the familiarity, I, I was uh, once uh, an international student at Lund University myself, and I, um, I was amazed of this openness. Um, but, and it, it was a little bit hard to adjust at the beginning because I was, um, uh, coming from a country where you address your professors in second person and so on. So <laughs> being so close to um, live living researchers and working alongside them, it, it was, a, um, yeah, it made a huge impact on me. Um, so, yeah. Yes, thank you, Anna Maria. Uh, we have a couple of questions that came in. I think uh, Lotta uh, might be suitable to answer. Uh, there's a person interested in the Master of Science in Bioinformatics. Is there a computer program language that could be added uh, or it could be an added advantage uh, for this program? I mean, all, all um, uh, programming uh, um, uh, knowledge is really important when it comes to bioinformatics. Uh, we usually advise students coming from, for instance, it's a, a program where we uh, can have a mixed background. Some are pure mathematics computing background some are a biology molecular bio background and of course we advise students coming from the non-computing area to to do some maybe some course or some, some um, to learn a little bit before the program that's a huge advantage okay but there is no specific computer language that would be better <laughs> no or, or, no yeah. just basic right any any basic computing language all and right. then you, we will take all students from there. But if you have some knowledge beforehand, it, it's uh, advantages. And we write that to, to the students uh, that apply or, or get accepted. Please uh, prepare for the program. It will yeah, lift you before the start and make it easier. Right. Thank you very much. Uh, another question also, I guess, uh, Lotta. Good day from the Philippines. What are the possible career opportunities in Sweden for graduates from the Master of Science in Molecular Biology? Uh, graduate, thanks. Uh, for molecular biology, most uh, master students go into PhD uh, and uh, the career paths there are, are uh, good. Uh, most of the master students in molecular biology actually do projects uh, connected to the medical faculty. It's like Maria, Anna Maria said before, it, it's, I mean, you don't have to stay at the science faculty. And so for molecular biologists and bioinformaticians, uh, most students find projects actually outside our department at the medical faculty, for instance, or even engineering faculty. So uh, yeah, for the molecular biologists, uh, uh, definitely, there's a career path uh, as uh, yeah in in, uh, in uh, science uh, or in uh, research and PhD positions. Uh, it, can I just ask a follow up? If, if a student is happy with their master's degree and do not want to pursue a, you know more uh, academic career or research oriented, if you want to join maybe a private or public sector company or organization, that would also be possible, I assume. Yeah, that's also possible. Uh, for some sectors, however, you actually need Swedish to continue, but not so much for molecular biology 
and bioinformatics, but for some sectors in biology, for instance, you you must also learn Swedish, of course, or take a work in, in the English speaking country. Mm. Well, I mean, that's our, important. That's important to know. But in, re in research and in most uh, research uh, strong uh, companies, you don't need the, the Swedish, I would say. Mm. Thank you, Lotta. I think what we generally say to students is that um, if they are, are looking to stay in Sweden for a long time after they finish their studies, it makes sense to learn Swedish anyway. And it will also uh, increase the number of opportunities you may have to join different companies of different sizes and not just uh, you know big multinational companies and also small and medium-sized companies. I would like to ask the other panelists because this is something that many uh, international students are interested in. What are the prospects after completing a master's degree in, uh, in um, the chemistry department? Do most students go on to do PhDs or is it as common to join uh, company or, or other public it's uh, around half of the students um, it's the latest figures I've seen uh, of our graduates uh, go into uh, a PhD and that happens both here in Lund but also elsewhere uh, and around half go into industry uh, and we have um, well quite a few of the students go into uh, local companies around them um, here in the area or in uh, in Copenhagen, uh, but of course people also find jobs uh, elsewhere in Sweden and elsewhere in the world. But uh, in general, chemistry graduates from Lund uh, have no problem finding relevant jobs both in industry or as a PhD student. Hmm. Thank you. Anna Maria, what about your graduates? Mathematics can be used in so many different types of contexts. What can students do after they finish a master's? Well, really lots of things. And it depends. Um, I mean, pure mathematician will tend to end up in academia. Uh, but um, if you work in more applied areas, um, as uh, I mean, a statistician, um, probably end up in bank and financing sector, um, working in companies com um, in uh, areas uh, close to computer science, um, data science, it's also very usual. Um, also many mathematicians work with uh, physicists in teams and yeah, and we have a very international environment. So our students, um, Starting a master's in loan, they also many of many of them return to their countries and and work in different areas, and we have quite close contact with our alumni. So uh, they really end up in all possible places. It's it's hard to generalize. But yeah. Uh, Don Hamalund, I would like to hear about geology. You also have several programs with several you know several specializations. Do do your graduates typically stay in academia or uh, are they uh, looking to for careers outside of academia? Uh, I would say that's probably a little less than 50% stay in the academic sector. I think there is now, a, or I know that there is now a growing uh, a sector within the uh, yeah, in, environmental uh, um, sector in, in general in, in society. So this is... Uh, uh, very advantageous, advantageous for, for our students and they, they go into different companies where they uh, work with things like uh, sustainable resource utilization and uh, mitigation of uh, climate change effects and also treatment of underground pollution and things like that. So this is a growing uh, sector, I would say. So, so, so this is probably the, the best uh, well, the, the, most of our students go that way, I would say, but, but a fair, fair uh, um, 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 may it also stay in, in, in academic sector, of course. Mm -hmm. What about uh, physics, Carl? You're very broad as well. Yes, uh, it's, it's broad and it's, it's maybe hard to generalize, but I, if I remember the figures from the Labor Market Council, uh, when, they, when they looked at this, where people end up, it is a lot of uh, programming related things that people end up in if they don't stay in academia. Uh, but also at other types of tech companies. I mean, I know people who've gone off to, uh, say, 
small companies doing some sort of research related to the, you know, spin-offs of various kinds. Of course, that's not the majority of the students, but these things certainly happen. Uh, some go on to do a PhD, but sadly, there are not nearly enough PhD positions for everyone who's done a master's. Um, and of course, not, not everybody wants to pursue that path anyway. Um, but yeah, it's, it's really a mix, but I think a lot of the students end up doing something computer related in the end where they have use of what they've learned um, in physics and so on. I mean, there are people doing say modeling, working with know, electrical systems or these, these various big things out in companies that I barely heard about, yeah. but it's, it's a big mix really. Yeah. I think we can conclude that a lot of our graduates in science do actually stay in academia, uh, at least for a while longer to do PhD uh, level uh, studies, it seems, perhaps more common than some other faculties. Um, I have a kind of a general question about the Faculty of Science and Learn that came in. What, what makes the Faculty of Science and Learn special compared with other universities? What can we say about that? I think we have an enormous freedom in the uh, sort of uh, types of courses you can take. Uh, you can also take courses in other subjects than the area of specialization. And then we have a very strong connection between the teaching and the research. I mean, that is not to say that this is not available in other universities, uh, but it is for sure, uh, clear that that is the case here and the, the faculty of science has a, a very broad research portfolio so i would say that any kind of um, work or direction that you're interested in you will probably be able to find that here anyone else we should perhaps also mention that we are now going through large changes of the faculty with the uh... Uh, with the inauguration of the, the large research facilities in Lund, uh, which can be useful for many different scientific disciplines, the uh, synchrotron light uh, uh, facility MAX4 and the uh, neutron spallation source uh, uh, facility ESS, which in the future will, or already now, is, is available for uh, different types of projects and, and also student engagements. So these research, faci the facilities we have are, are are big and, and plentiful. Uh, can we say anything about a cross uh, department or even cross faculty collaboration in research? Is that something that is uh, uh, something that we in Learn can claim to be quite good at? Three of our departments at the science faculty are joint between the Faculty of Science and Faculty of Engineering. And um, uh, at least at chemistry, there is uh, a lot of interaction uh, between the uh, engineering sort of side of chemistry and um, and the more uh, well pure side of chemistry. And so there are also um, a lot of opportunities for more applied projects, you could say. Mm. Carl, you had something to say about this? Yes, I would say uh, also there are a lot of yeah a lot of collaborations also. I mean, uh, looking at, at my department and the group I'm in specifically. I mean, we work with medicine, we work with biology. We have a lot of collaborations going on, and I don't think it's an uncommon thing in the research that to have both you know both external collaborations with with other uh, universities and so on where you also get to meet people. I mean, we've had several master's students who've gotten to uh, do projects, say in Cambridge, for instance, because we've had collaborations there or previous members who've moved there. And then these things happen, you know, and then you get this whole network of, of um, collaborations, not just within your own uh, department or groups, but also across all levels. And the students, as they are so close to the research, get to see some of this, at least. Mm. Uh, interesting point. Uh, Lotta, would you like to weigh uh, in? I, I think Ola summarized this uh, all very well. So I don't think, yeah, I mean, we all have co collaborations. I already mentioned our students usually find projects within the medical, medical faculty or 
uh, faculty of or medical science factor. So yeah. Okay, Anna Maria, you look happy. Are you satisfied with your colleagues' responses? Yes, um, they summarize it very well. So yeah, I don't and, have so much to add. No. Okay, thank you, Carl. You mentioned something that I find very very interesting here that uh, it's not just the internal networks, so maybe between departments and or uh, even faculties, but also the international. Uh, dimension how 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 important is that for our research and education would you say well for for us at least i mean it, it is a major part of at least some of the research i mean it depends on the researcher right some people have collaborations here some people have collaborations there some people have long-standing partners uh, perhaps connections to where they themselves did a postdoc once upon a time or somebody they met at a conference, you know, these things just sort of happen. Um, but then, of course, there are uh, various uh, networks. Uh, I'm thinking of things like UGLO, which the university is connected to, which help establish new collaborations. I mean, basically, because people go where the funding is. And if you can get money to do research together with people at a specific university, of course, you look for people there. Um, much as how students will go and, and do projects where these are available, right? Um, so for us, for me specifically, no ongoing collaborations abroad at the moment, but others at my department, certainly, and others elsewhere. Um, and it's, it's fun to get these uh, also visitors, you know, when you have uh, people from somewhere else, they come in, they give some talks, might be department wide. Certainly, master students will come and listen as well. So people are invited to become part of uh, part of the research environment and hear about what's going on and you know, comment on it and so on. It's, it's very fun to see how students grow into this and uh, how they somehow make the transition from uh, well, from bachelor student to master students, getting more into it, and then suddenly there a lot of them are PhD students. Yeah, typically the ones who are most involved already before, right? That's correct. Uh, is there any other panelists who would like to speak about, you know, the importance of international collaboration at their departments or programs or research teams? Well, geology is a very international uh, subject because it's a, a useful course all over the world, and, and we really benefit from having students from from other countries uh, uh, coming with different perspectives and, and uh, interacting with with our Swedish students. I think this is very valuable for us. Right, and I think maybe we should explain to panel, uh, sorry, the audience members that. In Sweden, most bachelor's programs are taught in Swedish, of course, but then for the master's level, we go to English. So we find a larger mix of local and international students at master's level. Um, I was, uh, there was a question here. I'm a Dutch student interested in the master's program in conservation biology, Lotta, but I was wondering if there's a certain maximum capacity of students for certain masters could not find this information on the website so how, how many students do you admit uh, you have several specializations yeah i mean uh, overall in biology i think we uh, enroll like 50 students each year uh, we have more applicants uh, but it's not extremely hard to get in if you meet the requirements um but we do have some selection pressure on the program, uh, more so for molecular biology and bioinformatics. Oh, a, a more kind of general question. When, when we do the admission to our programs and we look at the student, um, what is it that we're looking for? Is it just the grades or the GPA or is it something else? What makes a student stand out uh, in the competition? Okay, I can, uh, I mean, the selection, uh, I think it differs between different uh, programs, actually, you have to look into, uh, into that uh, in the admission information, application information, uh, but uh, the grades are important, but also uh, the letter of intent and so on, or so, so uh, also, and uh, for bioinformatics and, and biology, we also have uh, other 
uh, uh, selections on uh, projects you have done, internships, uh, practical activities, and so on. So yeah, we, we select on different paths. Please check the, the application information where will you, you will find this for all the programs. Right. The, but most, most importantly, I think it's uh, great. Okay, so the selection criteria for each program will actually state uh, how yeah. students are collected, on what basis they are uh, selected. Yes, but, yes. But what, what are we looking for in our students? I mean, what, what types of skills and knowledge can we, do we believe oh, he or she will probably be a successful student? I mean, aside from grades or a GPA, Ola, what do you say? What kind of skills and, and talents are important for students to have before they join a master's? I'm not involved in the selection process, but if I look to uh, what uh, students need in order to be uh, successful, of course, uh, grades are important in the terms of sort of background knowledge, but uh, more important is uh, probably uh, interest and tenacity. I mean, to, to take your studies seriously and work hard uh, during courses and projects will uh, lead to success. I mean, I, I, I have had the students, I had one student from outside of Europe who came, he took my course and in the beginning had um, maybe some lack in, in basic knowledge in chemistry in some areas, but he worked really hard. He later became, did a project with me he became a PhD student. He's now a graduated PhD in chemistry and he works at Göteborg University. Um, and so I, I think um, interest and uh, the, um, the willingness to, to work hard is extremely important. Mm. Uh, I don't know if Carl, Don and Anna Maria would like to say anything about that. What types of qualities you look for in a student or kind of what kind of skills are required or necessary to be a successful master's student? Our selection criteria are, are, are great, of course, but we also look at uh, uh, the breadth of, of the, the bachelor's uh, education. And, and as geology is a rather uh, multifaceted subject, uh, we would like to see that there is a variety of different courses included in, in the bachelor's program so that uh, we can let them into all our courses. We have some courses that require specific uh, specific uh, education in, in, in some parts of the geology subjects. So, so you, uh, yeah, you, you want to make sure that students fulfill uh, the entry requirements to certain courses that you offer at the department. Yeah, we, we always uh, make a little introductory uh, discussion with the specifics or the individual students about their study paths so that we can secure that they fulfill their requirements. Right. Anna Maria, what's it like at mathematics? What skills do you, would you recommend that students have if they want to join a math? I mean, they have the academic skills and that's fine. Let's say they, they fulfill the entry requirements as they are stated, but how can can you become a successful student in the master's program? I think what's required is a keen interest in, in the subject and for problem solving, especially um, uh, for theoretical aspects of mathematics and so on. I'm uh, handling uh, the um, in, the admission, in the admission process, I'm looking at the specific requirements and uh, the minimum specific requirement is 90 credits in mathematics, but um, of course, among the 200 applicants, let's say, uh, if we select 15 to 20, this will be applicants with, uh, who, who took lots of courses in different area of mathematics within the um, bachelor studies. So uh, as, as Don said, uh, if, I mean, this reflects the student's interest in different uh, areas of maths. So, um, and this, of it's the, a basis for the future success as well in the program. Mm. Carl, do you uh, agree? Uh, oh, yes, yes. But uh, I mean, I'm thinking here specifically about some things. I mean, you talked about what, what it takes to be a successful student and I mean, hard work and all that. But I, I think there are some points also that come up sometimes when students have trouble 
uh, which point to what thing, you know, things that, that you could think about uh, as skills that you need to have. And one is to be able to manage your own time because there's so much responsibility for uh, taking courses on time, you know, managing basically your schedule and not suddenly finding yourself having to study for two exams and, and in a bunch of late reports all at once, but rather to, to be able to portion this out and uh, somehow handle all the other distractions that appear as a student and all the fun things you can do and at the same time uh, work on your on your studies and uh, as I said reports and so on and then also to come and ask for help basically you know to let us know if there is a problem because this is a very common thing that happens that students uh, don't ask for help soon enough and so I think if you can take responsibility for for managing your schedule and for raising a flag when when there is a problem, that really helps you as a student. You know, once you're actually admitted and, and working on things, mm-hmm. and yeah. maybe also some flexibility in terms of uh, you know what you want to do, what courses you want to take, and so on. Adjust to what you find you're good at, or you know what's less work or more work for you specifically. So. These sorts of skills are, I think, in the long run, important for the students. Mm-hmm. Okay, thank you. So we're talking here uh, to the master's degree programs, but I would just like to, because we've received this question uh, from time to time, and it's people are wondering, you know, the difference between master's, uh, bachelor's level studies and master's level studies. Could you say a few words about what students can expect? What's the difference between studying at bachelor's level and studying at master's level? In, in a place like Lund, is there a difference? Is it just more difficult, or is it more work, more books, more lab, more of everything? Or what, what's the difference, uh, Lotta? Could you say uh, I, I, I don't think I don't think that you can say that there's a difference between bachelors and master. I think it's more difference between different cultures how you study. And I think, as Carl said, uh, taking responsibility. I mean, you can probably pass a course with pretty low um, uh, uh, input. But if you want to to learn a lot, you have to make it more efforts to pass the course. And that, I think that's pretty important to know. And if you want to make a career, I mean, you should put in that, um, as Ola said, I mean, you, you can learn a lot on your own to to kind of fill up the gaps that you might have but uh, for students coming from sweden it's not so much difference between bachelor and master's courses i think but it's more uh, which country you come from and the difference there and it's not just to kind of tell what the teachers told you on the lectures it's you must use your own logics and so on that's more important Mm, I think Anna Maria mentioned that a bit previously because she had studied in another country before coming to Lund and had to adjust, I suppose, to the way uh, we offer education here. So would you say that there is a kind of maybe a cultural culture clash in the beginning, but then once you get past that, it's it's actually a very good experience? Anna Maria? I think that, uh, so I, I uh, came to Sweden right after high school, so of course it is a different uh, difference between how you study math at the uh, high school level and how you study math at bachelor's and master's level. And in our department, I would say, so um, there is a difference between um, how much um, support to get as a bachelor's student um, compared to uh, students at master's level. So we offer mar- um, I mean, our master's students are more independent in their work uh, of, because they are also build up uh, um, study strategy um, during their bachelor's studies, I would say. So uh, we support, we, we have lots of um, teaching hours in the beginning of the bachelor's program, but the teaching, the number of teaching hours and uh, extra support decreases at, at master's level. So we expect our master's students to, to work more independently and um, have already built up, uh, um, yeah, a study strategy that works for them. Mm, so study skills and managing your time, basically, and exactly. I, I suppose it requires a certain level of personal maturity to 
to to to complete these things successfully. Sure. Um, I was wondering. We have a, a question here. It happens once in a while that students would like to kind of transfer directly into a master's program because they have already started a master's program in the same subject in their home country, but then they want to transfer and take the credits with them. And this is uh, in physics, a person is wondering if he or she can start the second year directly in learned if they already have studied physics in their home country. Yeah, and to the best of my knowledge, the short answer is no, you can't jump straight into the second year like that, but you can apply, I mean, you can apply normally into the program and it, and then your you know whatever courses you've taken uh, we'll have to match them up with the courses that we have and see what have you covered already maybe there are some courses you know where you already meet all the goals for the courses that we have so we can just scratch them off the list of things that are required and um, i don't know about credit transfer as such that's something that somebody else will have to talk about because if I mean because obviously you want your 120 credits to be able to get your degree but as far as requirements for specific courses go that can be solved if the course contents are equivalent and we have locally students who've done a bachelor and then taken a bunch of other courses in the meantime who start the master's program and might go more or less straight to doing a project so it's quite possible to finish a two year pro uh, two year program in a year if you already have courses that you've passed but if you're coming from abroad where it's not the same courses and where you don't have swedish credits uh, that part i do not know if, if the credits can be transferred in but maybe somebody else here can answer yeah. that part of the question Lotta, yeah, uh, I think it's pretty common that you you transfer credits from uh, previous master studies, uh, and the requirements for the different masters differ. So it's really hard to say uh, this is how it works. But for for my point of view, we have like thirty credits uh, in a master is totally optional. I think it's the same for all master's programs. I'm not sure in science. I, I'm not totally sure, but I think so. So 30 credits is very easy to, to transfer. And no problem at all, I would say. And then for specific courses, because all programs require uh, some compulsory courses. And for those, it's, it's a little bit more hard to, to transfer. Um, I mean, then we have to, to look really deep into what's uh, yeah the course uh, syllabi and so on uh, but then there are optional courses and uh, there you have a more option but always contact a study director or advisor or study advisor or something if you want to uh, because you can't find this information on the internet it's impossible it be, it's so personal yeah, and I think what we want to tell people is that regardless if they can or cannot or will be allowed to transfer credits, they still have to apply and become admitted in, in competition with other students. And then after you come to learn, eventually you will have to speak with your program uh, director or representatives about potentially transferring some credits that you have completed in your home country. Uh, so, but you still have to apply in competition with other students and be admitted. Uh, so you cannot jump straight into the second year just because you happen to have uh, studied physics before. Um, um, I can say so. You can, you can actually, but you can't apply for the second year master. Then you have to apply for freestanding courses, and then you can make a late application for the master's program. But always contact someone at the department level, and we'll let you know. Yeah, so contact your program and or department for help with that. Um, there's another physics. I'm looking forward to study physics as a bachelor and learned. Could you please introduce physics courses in details and about the fields we are working on at Lund University? So more like as a bachelor, so here it is at the bachelor's level, uh, physics. Uh, can you, uh, Carl, give an example well, of the types of courses that we offer? I could give some, but I don't have the complete overview of the bachelors, uh, unfortunately, uh, which is why I, I, I'm in this session and not the bachelor one, uh, because so it's, it's been reshaped a number of times, right? But uh, 
one of the things, I mean, some of it is on the physics, or all of it really is on the physics website in terms of what, uh, what courses you take. So uh, one thing you do is you take a mix of mathematics and physics in the bachelor's. So it's together with uh, mathematics that some of these courses are given. Uh, and there's nowadays also a, a bit of programming in there. So there's a Python programming, uh, numerical method stuff that's very useful later on. Um, and then for the physics, there is, well, it's, it's as, you can, as you can imagine, a, quite a big mix of different things for the first was it two years or so with um, all sorts of, of physics? I mean, I took physics myself back then. It was a little bit different, but it was still this big mix of various subjects in physics, you know, various directions. Seven and a half credits of this, 15 credits of that, um, everything from uh, electrodynamics to uh, quantum mechanics. Um, so at the bachelor's level, you have a lot of different uh, areas that you cover um, with a small amount of each. And uh, still quite a few courses that are required, but then at the, towards the end, more flexibility. And as it has been pointed out here, there is, I mean, that's a general thing here, right? That you have a lot of, uh, quite a, well, quite a few credits that, that are quite free. So in the, uh, in the master's program, there's at least, as Lotta said, at least 30 credits. Um, if we look at physics, we typically have five required uh, quarter of a semester courses, so 37 and a half credits. So that's just over one semester of things that are more or less required. I mean, we have, for, for the physics programs, we have two courses. I mean, looking at the master's level, we have two courses that are required and three where you choose among five or six courses or so. Um, and then you have a project, with, which is another half a year, which basically gives you almost a year's worth of flexibility, um, where you can't go and take all the courses at, say, another department or so. Some fraction of that has to be within physics, but it's quite free in terms of what you choose. And what we see also at the bachelor's level is that Bachelor of students take courses at both the uh, what we call the, the basic and advanced level. Um, so advanced level courses are typically master's courses then, but people can take these at, at, uh, uh, as part of a bachelor's program if you fulfill the uh, requirements. And so bachelor of students will sometimes come into the master's program with some of the master's courses already taken care of, which gives additional flexibility. I hope that, yeah, I hope that goes some ways to, ans to answering that. But if you really want the details on the physics, it's the uh, physics uh, website where, where you find the lists of courses. Yeah, exactly. So please do visit the Department of Physics uh, International website to see what kind of courses and areas that are covered in the, it's very broad. We could probably say, Carl, I mean, the number of um, different, um, research areas in, in, in physics that students can take courses in. Uh, so we have here a biological science question. I am from India and I'm interested in Master of Science Biological Sciences program. Since Lund accepts only students with a four-year bachelor degree, bachelor of science degree, I assume from India, I was curious about the scope for doing my research internship at Lund while pursuing a master in, at another international university. Uh, I don't really understand the question, but I mean, the, the length of the program is the same. Uh, we require a four-year bachelor or a three-year plus uh, one-year master from, for students from India, for instance. And uh, I mean, that's the basic requirements. Uh, and But the total length of the master's here will always be two years. So you, you will still have your coursework uh, of at least 60 credit advanced level. We talk credits here, 60 credits is one year of full-time studies. And then you have the, the master thesis, which can be uh, performed outside Lund University. As, uh, yeah. uh, we, are, we are very flexible, I would say, but I mean, the total 
length of study will still be two years. Yeah, I, 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 I hope have, that, that was the, uh, the. I I don't necessarily. I'm not quite sure either what the question actually is because this person is probably considering doing a, a master's program at another university, not learned, but okay. he or she would like to join Lund as a on a research internship. Anyway. Yeah, I mean, uh, if a person want to come here to do a research internship without being a student, you just have to contact the, the researchers directly, then you're not a student here, if you want to make an internship here. Right. So, or maybe some type of exchange situation. Yeah, I mean, own. exchange programs we have, but that's from uh, the person's own university. Right. Application vi vi via the home university, so to say. Okay, thank you. My uh, another question. My interest in is in the astrophysics master program, and I want to know more about the admission rates of all physics programs. Also, is there a way to talk with current students? Well, yes, there is a way to talk with current students. If you go to our website, uh, there's a link. Uh, we have a platform called Unibody, where more than 80 current international students are available to chat with about their experience uh, studying and learn. Um, so it is possible to talk with current students. Um, you can do so today. Uh, but we have the astrophysics question. Carl, did you work with astrophysics? Well, I mean, it's my department, so I should know that. <laughs> that. Yeah. Uh, sorry. So they merged us with uh, with astronomy ages ago. Uh, so admissions rates. Uh, that's a very good question. I mean, one thing. Uh, for astrophysics, I don't know. For physics, uh, well, it, it depends on how you how you define it because we admit about 30 to 35 students, I think, or well, 35 maybe, because then, then some, you know, some don't accept the position. But uh, there is this whole, uh, I mean, it's a series of steps you have to go through, right? First, you have to pass the general requirements and a lot of students fail there because you know, they didn't have, they didn't upload the right documents or they didn't have the English or they didn't have a, an actual bachelor's degree or something there. So there are, there's a loss of students there at that stage. And then some students don't fulfill the specific requirements. They don't have, you know, enough physics, for instance. And then, then the numbers you get depend on whether you include these or not. But for the rest, maybe Oh, it, it varies so much. It varies from year to year how many applications we get. Uh, but somewhere, I would say half, a third, somewhere there are accepted. It's the numbers so, sound a bit depressing. Maybe it's maybe it's um, maybe it's a bit more that are accepted actually. But it, it comes down really then to to how you define it. Uh, <laughs> I, the the question is a bit general as well, yeah. because he, he or she is talking about all the physics programs. Yeah, no, yeah, uh, and I, I'm thinking about all the different physics programs, because I, I usually go through and look at the admissions for them to get an mm -hmm. overview. I actually did that before the session, just to have an overview of how many students do have. But I didn't count how many, uh, how many applicants actually made it through the uh, selection, I mean, the, the stricter criteria first. Um, but then if, if you look at the students, I mean, we, we rank the students, right? That's, that's how this works. We sit there and look at all the applications and try to put some sort of numbers on, on basically how good is, uh, as we said before, this, you know, the grades, letters, other things. Um, so, um, and then, then uh, well, some, some people make it, some don't. And what, what's really annoying is that sometimes you have students who would would uh, be good students on the programs who are not admitted because we can only take so many students per year. Um, but um, yeah, somehow, somewhere there's also a line, of course, where, where students probably would not even succeed. I mean, looking at how they've done in the past, they would struggle uh, and uh, hopefully we'll put the cut above that line. But in terms of how many, I don't know, 50% admission rate, 40, 30? Uh, Depends, I think numbers, but... basically. But I think if you want to, uh, the person here should probably contact the program uh, representative directly to- Yeah, for that specific program. For that specific program. 
But I mean, look at it this way. If you do not participate in the application round and hand in all the, then you don't have a chance to be admitted. So the only way to have a chance to be considered for admission is to actually make an application. I students, I in my experience, sometimes overthink before they make an application, you know, just go ahead and make an application if you want to take this program. And then if you make a convincing application, you have a chance to participate in the selection. Um, what about uh, uh, for geology? You have three specializations, Dawn. Um, do you have any type of numbers or idea about uh, how, how easy or difficult it is to be selected for the program? Well, unfortunately, we have a rather low application pressure, so we have uh, generally no selection pressure at all. So and as long as you have fulfilled the requirements, you are welcome to study with us. Okay. Yeah. Is it, uh, Anna Maria, is it the same at the Department of Mathematics, uh, or is there a more competitive uh, process? I'd say that so in the last admission round we had around 200 applicants um around 80 of them were uh, meeting the uh all the requirements and uh 15 started the program so 15 15 yeah mm. what about uh, a biology department lotta uh, uh it varies between the programs of course as we said before uh, like for bioinformatics and uh, the molecular biology, uh, biotechnology, which are the most uh, competitive programs, we might have 200 or 200 applicants uh, first priority, maybe uh, something like 75 of these are eligible. Uh, and we might accept 50 and then uh, in the end, a third of these will turn up so i mean it, it's a kind of drop all the way uh, so it's, it's really really hard but what you can say is our programs are there are not heaps of students on them we have teaching intense courses so don't be afraid that we only accept 10 students on the programs usually there are more as as carl said before uh, students from different programs and even bachelor students at, at last year take the courses together and also exchange students and so on and so forth. Uh, so usually a class would be around 30 students uh, and it's very teaching intense and that's something you should should keep in mind. You will have a lot of interactions with the with, uh, professors and assistants on the courses, which is will give you a very good education. It's it's amazing, I would say, the, the kind of connection between students and, and teachers. But yeah, so we have pretty few students on the programs, but the, the, the quality is best. Maybe I can comment on, on, on one thing there uh, related to the question you posed, Johan, about the uh, general uh, study culture or level at the master's level at our faculty. I should say that we do care about uh, generic skills and, and, and uh, this is quite important and, and well thought through, at least at our department. So there's a progression with this and, and we do, uh, of course, provide training in things like uh, different types of written uh, um, exercises, documents of different kinds, and of course also uh, uh, um, uh, oral presentations and, and interactions in different uh, ways within science. So this is uh, sometimes a bit of a novelty and even a bit scary for international students, but I can say that it is usually highly appreciated. And, and this is part of our culture where we really encourage interaction with, with our, our teachers and, and, and peers. Hmm. Thank you, Don. Uh, we have a, also another physics question. Um, so, Carl, do you have at the Department of Physics experts in theoretical physics or gravitational physics at Lund? Well, in the physics, uh, there's a follow up uh, as well. In the physics department, do you encourage interdisciplinary research uh, to come up with innovative ideas? So, I'll start with the technical bit, which <laughs> is just saying that there is a department of astronomy and theoretical physics. So the, the question about the theoretical physics is, no, it's not the Department of Physics. Uh, but <laughs> of course, I mean, that's an organizational matter more mm. than anything. Uh, but yes, so, so theoretical physics, certainly there is a, a specific uh, program specialization for theoretical physics, uh, which is one of those that has the most applicants now, I think. That's that and the general one that uh, are the biggest. 
and um, what people do with gravity, I honestly don't know. I mean, the, I know the astronomers do a lot of a lot of simulations of galaxy formation and, and planetary system formation and things like that. Um, more theoretical work. I uh, should know this. Um, you'll have to look up what people are actually publishing, I think, to see uh, see what they study. I mean, it, it, theoretical physics, what people work with in Lund is particle physics. So high energy collection, collisions, you know, the sort of things that people simulate or the sort of things that people do experiments with at CERN, for instance. So doing simulations of these things is a big thing uh, at our department. Um, and then I'm on the biological side of things where, uh, I mean, we're, we're sprung out of theoretical physics, but we've uh, moved much more into, uh, say, biological physics, computational biology these days. Uh, and there we can speak about interdisciplinary uh, collaborations, because we do a lot of these with uh, medicine and biology and uh, well, various other things. Uh, and there are collaborations between people at my department and uh, the nanophysics. Uh, so that's part of uh, engineering or, I mean, so, so physics is also, as was pointed out here before by, I think it was Ula, pointed out that, that several of the, uh, of the departments, including them physics, are split between the faculty of science and the faculty of engineering. So there is already there uh, sort of coming into the same discipline from two different uh, different angles. But I, I hope that goes some way towards answering the question. But yes, interdisciplinary work is important and common. Oops, I'm sorry, I muted myself. Um, we have a question, Lotta. As a Norwegian student looking into microbiology, would it be possible to join a Swedish taught program or do you recommend English? No, definitely we have uh, for for the Nordic countries we have uh, you don't know have taken Swedish at batch, at high school to join. Uh, definitely we have Norwegians we have students at bachelor's level from Norway, uh, Denmark, uh, Finland uh, and Iceland. So yeah, no problem I would say. I mean there are some and uh, the lectures are always in Swedish or almost always, but the books are always in English, so you will have no problem at all. Okay, yeah, good, thank you. Um, here is, a, I don't know if the panelists are able to answer this question. Is it possible as an Erasmus student to work in a research group? So I assume they want to, their home university is somewhere in Europe, but they want to join a research team based in Lund or uh, as a Erasmus student. Is that something you know anything about the panelists? Yeah, no problem, no problem at all. Uh, we have students uh, coming on a Erasmus exchange that uh, come here only and do their half year, even one year uh, project that they then uh, get credited for at their home university. Uh, but you also have the Erasmus traineeship uh, scholarship that it, you can apply for from your home university. And in that case, you always contact the, the research group here. But you, you do the application from your home university if it's the traineeship you're uh, thinking of. Um, and, um... Questions are jumping up and down here. Um, another question is, if we are interested in physiology, would you rather advise us to apply for biomedicine or general biology? Maybe Lotta. Uh, I would not say general biology. General biology uh, in Lund, it's more ecology and stuff like that, the green biology. Uh, if you're interested in physiology, I advise you to apply for either molecular biology medical uh, specialization or the master in uh, biomedicine which is of course more uh, human uh, specialized so look into to uh, what the master which courses are uh, included in the master's programs before you apply and also contact the the program specific coordinators 
Mm. But anyway, not the general biology one, rather biomedicine. I, I mean, you, you can. I have students uh, <laughs> accepted for, we, can, we have a general program in, in biology where we, uh, we, where we have courses in, in um, immunology, um, uh, toxicology, pharmacology, and stuff like that. But usually, uh, career-wise, I would say a background in molecular biology, if you want to do physiology, it's more or anyway, a little bit more background in, you can go in via a master's in, in biology, yes, if you don't meet the requirements for the, for the other programs. Okay. It's also a matter of that. Thank you. Uh, a, a question also from the same student. Do you have any tips on how to build our degree project prior to entering a biology master of science degree? So the degree project at bachelor's level, do you look at this yeah, uh, the selection for the biology, we look also at the, uh, the research projects you might have done. And so that's an uh, important uh, component. Uh, but don't be afraid because we, as Don said, we don't have a extremely high application pressure on the programs. So, um, but it, it is uh, advantages, yes, yes, but not extremely important. Mm. Okay. Uh, for you, other Don, Carl, and Anna Maria, do you look at the degree project uh, from the students' bachelor's uh, level when you uh, assess their applications for master's programs? Is this important? I, I assume all Swedish students have some kind of degree project at bachelor's level, but we know that in other countries, it may not be a, a natural component of a bachelor's degree to have a thesis or a degree project at the end. Uh, we don't look at the uh, at the degree project specifically. Uh, as long as you have a degree uh, that is uh, sufficient for the uh, entry requirements, uh, this is enough. Yeah, I would say the same. I don't really look at it. I mean, if it's a Swedish student. If it's somebody who's been at our department, for instance, I may remember them and I may also look because I think it's, I mean, especially if they struggled with it and they, you know, just barely passed, then they're going to struggle even more with the next one. But for somebody from abroad, uh, no, it, the systems are so different. I, I, you know, sometimes people send like long things they've done, especially with the maybe slightly older uh, applicants who've had time to do various things and they might send off a whole bunch of research papers or or things like that and, and i don't know we we get too much stuff sometimes in the applications uh, oh i could mention that by the way when i'm when you know when people are on the line here it's it's um uh, some students like uh, including all of their uh, course syllabi like hundreds of pages of stuff uh, and that's not very helpful it doesn't really help us make any decisions it's just uh, just lots of papers to look through for no reason mm -hmm. so don't do that unless you have to so please audience members if you're applying to physics do not do that Anna Maria do you look at the degree project uh, of a student bachelor's uh, degree well project? We, we look at courses so of course uh, if the degree the degree project is one of the courses um, we take a look at that but usually applicants do not submit the entire um, text so yeah it's it's just a course among many of course if it's um, in of course it can affect uh the overall um marking but uh, yeah it's we don't look at that specifically no. mm. okay thank you so i have a question here coming in about uh and this is a question that is very common because all the programs represented here today have uh specific entry requirements and when we write about the specific entry requirements, we say you need a certain number of ECTS in certain subjects or a major or, and this is can be problematic for international students to figure out how do I convert my credits to ECTS. 
Uh, Lotta, is this some a problem for your students? Uh, yeah, don't, don't worry. Don't try to convert. We are uh, used to looking at transcripts from all over the world. We are aware that the credit systems uh, differ and the grades as well. So, yeah, no problem. Don't bother. Uh, I, of course, it can be think that 60 ECTS credits uh, is one year of full-time studies. So if we require science studies, 90 credits, that's kind of one and a half year of full-time studies for you. That's what you should uh, think of a little bit. Um, anyone else? Do you, do you recommend that? Uh, because this person is uh, referring to a summary sheet, and I do not actually know if any of the programs represented here right now would use a summary sheet uh, as part of the special document. Do you, Anna Maria, do you have a summary sheet? Yes, we have a summary sheet. And mm -hmm. uh, I think it's important for students, I mean, for, for their own sake, to know that they meet uh, the specific requirements to do this. Um, um, conversion to ECTS credits. But as Lotta said, uh, 30 ECTS credits uh, represent full-time studies during one semester. So uh, this would give students an idea how to do the conversion to, to, to really be sure that they meet the, the specific requirements in terms of credits. But then it's not important that they make the conversion for us because we will do it. But it's just important for their own sake when we do the application so they are sure that yeah they meet the requirements. Yeah, it's a little bit different because some programs in Lund, maybe not the programs represented here, but some programs, for example, I believe in uh, engineering, they actually require that the student themselves convert credits and, and show this on the summary sheet. And, and that uh, for some students, uh, that is uh, problematic for a variety of reasons. Um, but yeah, so I guess maybe the question was related to that. But what we, I guess what we can say basically is that it, it, it's the student's responsibility to, 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 to figure out if they, are, if they fulfill the entry requirements or not, and then do make the application and the, the program uh, will assess uh, and convert your credits to make sure that you have the uh, requisite amount. Um, there is a biology question again, lots of biology questions today. <laughs> yep. Hello, my interest is in the biology masters, and I noticed that the university has research projects related to ecophysiology and adaptation to climate change. Yeah. Is this is this something that is included in the curriculum? Uh, I, I mean, it's it's included in uh, some of the courses. I suppose you think of now uh, evolutionary animal ecology, for instance. There we have ecophysiology. We have a research group that work with this. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, uh, the best way we can't cover, I mean, there's no course specifically in this area, but if you want to deep, uh, yeah, deep in this, uh, then you do a project within that research group, of course, that's the best way of learning this specific area. Mm. Very good, a project within the research group. I think I want to extend the question to Dawn at Geology because you, your uh, department uh, deals with this topic uh, quite a lot than climate change. Uh, in the program, how can students uh, select courses that are related or relevant for climate change? Because Yeah, this is of course a very important component of the geology curriculum and, and we look at climate change of course in different time perspectives and, and uh, I could say that in this perspective there's also now a, a new a brand new course that we will uh, teach now for the first time from next year uh, which we call uh, global change from a geological perspective and, and this includes and, and it has actually quite generous entry requirements so, so all uh, science students can take that course and, and that will provide you with an insight into uh, uh, so to say, all our ongoing changes in society today in the perspective of uh, what has happened in the past so on a timeline that is relevant for that. And that includes uh, links to, of course, the UN uh, Sustainability Goals and, and uh, all such uh, important issues that we have to deal with uh, for our future challenges. Uh, but certainly, yes, uh, climate change is important and, and, uh, and, and an in, uh, integral part of the geology curriculum that's within all the uh, the different specializations, I would say. 
respect more so even so for course on, on the quaternary geology uh, branch of the program uh, where, where we uh, look even more into this okay interesting thank you uh, so there is a follow-up question from before, I believe it was Lotta that answered the, if it's possible to join a research group as an Erasmus student or just as an Erasmus trainee. I, yeah, I mean, that depends on what you, what, what you think of. I mean, we have students uh, applying from Lund University to go out to different un uh, universities in Europe as Erasmus traineeship students. You apply from your home university and you make contact with the research group in Lund yourself. Uh, I mean, there are also Erasmus exchange students. That's another thing. So just make sure what you are and what you're thinking of, and then find out what the possibilities are. Right. And I think this person would have an international office in, in their home university that could help them with the different uh, Erasmus uh, exchange opportunities in Europe. Um, if I could add something there, yeah, I mean, please. If, if we look at, at on, so to speak, our side of it, the, in Lund, the way that you become a part of a research group in some sense is typically that you are doing your master's thesis, right? I mean, at least at our at our department, that's how things are. I mean, you're, you may, you're a master's student for two years, you take courses, and or, or you know or, or you might come in on an exchange but it's during your master's thesis work which is then half a year or a full year that's when you're really immersed in some sort of research group and at our department we also that's also when you may get an office there for a while or you know have may or may not but typically you get a, some space to sit and you're invited to like the join people in the coffee room and come to seminars and so on. So that's when people are more included, uh, sort of almost as uh, at the same level as PhD students. Uh, uh, can I just add, uh, I mean, we have like 10 students or 15 students each year going to university in Europe on the Erasmus traineeship. We have students coming here from various universities in Europe for Erasmus traineeship. It's not uncommon at all. They stay for, uh, two months up to one year it's 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 not uncommon but please check as you said please check with your the international office at your home university about the options okay thank you um here is a question maybe carl um or anyone really because this is also kind of more broadly perhaps interesting for st science students how 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 likely is it that they can join a phd program after maybe they finish a, a a master's degree we talked a little bit about it before and and it seems quite common for science students to do a phd but not necessarily in lund um carl can you uh no, not elaborate? necessarily in lund and not necessarily in their own subject area as the question alludes to here specifically oh yeah for, that's true yeah, specifically for geology i cannot answer but but uh, oh, what were the numbers again? I, this is this is numbers I maybe should have had in my head, but uh, there a fair fraction of the students go on to do a PhD, and at least for the students we see, they they go sort of all over the place. I mean, not everybody ends up at our department, that's for sure. Um, and uh, people go into related fields, yes, uh, because once you get up to this level, the one thing is that the the PhD projects rarely follow the same subject lines as um, as the master's program and the courses. It's more specialized, right? And you, you might need a certain type of specialization. You, I mean, you might end up doing, a, you know, say, a, a medical doctor might end up doing something in physics because it's a medically related field where it doesn't really matter that you didn't take a lot of physics courses because it's your skills that are required and likewise a physicist might end up working with for instance biologists or something like that because it's some more specific uh, subject that you're doing i would certainly yeah. agree this is uh, uh, that's a high degree of flexibility today within uh, the, the, the 
change of subjects. And, and I would say that having a, a master's degree in science from Lund University uh, puts you well off in the competition uh, generally. Uh, and of course, uh, your choice of degree project is very important because uh, the, the uh, uh, the PhD position in question might, might require a specific uh, methodology or, or insight into specific questions. So, so your choice of, of degree project is important, but uh, having a master's degree is really advantageous. So thank you. That answers the question. Um, we have a question for Lotta. How can you describe a typical semester for molecular biology, medical biology student? How do you assess students' learning? Is it through written exams, oral exams, or practical exams? How many uh, hours? Uh, sorry, how yeah. many hours are consumed <laughs> for lectures and laboratory classes every day? Okay, uh, short question. Uh, <laughs> all courses have written exams, with some exceptions, uh, but you're also ass assessed on your uh, lab work, uh, project reports, uh, uh, seminars, uh, etc. Um, usually those are not graded, only the, the exam is graded. Some courses have small, small exams uh, throughout the course, some has uh, big exams after the course. So what was the next question? Uh, a typical week uh, is about one third lab, one third um, seminars, group works, one third uh, lectures. And I would say like 25 hours a week is scheduled, but not all are compulsory parts. But it differs between classes uh, and, and subjects, of course. Mm. So I think a, a general question to the panelists, because uh, we know that sometimes students come from uh, countries where at university uh, people take maybe five, six, seven different courses at the same time. But that is not uh, common here uh, in, in Sweden or in Learn, where we take maybe one or two at the same time. Uh, Don, could you explain how it works at the Department of Geology uh, for master's students? You mean the course structure? We, we have, uh, mm -hmm. in principle, we have eight master's courses and, and they are always taught the same period of the year. So uh, you, you, uh, you study one course at a time, full time, and, and, and then uh, you decide yourself uh, your study path in, 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 in uh, 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 agreement with your advisor, of course, and then, then plan ahead. And you have to apply for the courses for the next term uh, a bit in ahead. But that we will explain to you. Uh, but it's full time studies and, and one subject at a time. One subject. How many courses do you have per semester typically? Two courses per, per semester, one in the first part and one in the second part. And then we have degree projects, uh, which then cover three modules. So they are 45 credits. What about you, Anna-Maria, at mathematics? How many courses does a student typically take per semester? Typically, it's four courses uh, of 7.5 credits each. So our courses are, the majority of them are given at half pace um during one half of the semester so then they are uh, they correspond to 7.5 ects credits we also have some courses that are given at quarter quarter pace um but these are courses that match together so uh, students select courses corresponding to 30 credits uh and the, the usual thing is that they are they're taking two courses in parallel um Two and courses in parallel. Say it's uh, 10 to 12 hours in class each week, but we count uh, on the fact that students put up uh, at least 40 hours of, uh, I mean, in total uh, study time per week. This, this is what we uh, consider to be a full time working week. Okay. Uh, Carl, how do you assess students uh, after they take a, a, a course? How do you? Uh, it's it's a mix really of, of written exams uh, and reports and then oral exams so quite common with oral exams i think in, in physics mm -hmm. uh, we have uh, yeah, we have a bunch of courses where we do that and for some students it's the first time that they experience this i mean students coming in from abroad they haven't had an oral exam before sometimes and uh, well, it's usually okay, you know, sometimes people get nervous, but it's, uh, 
I think it's, it's, a, it's a rather efficient way, actually, if you don't have too many students, because you spend, well, half an hour, an hour with the student asking questions and, and get a pretty good overview of what that student knows. Um, but then, uh, yeah, and then, then, as I said, reports and so on. And of course, we, there's the whole thing about trying to, to sort of pace it out across uh, the, the semester so that not everything is at the end. Um, but obviously when you have exams at the end, that's when things are going to be most intense. Mm. Um, I have one course where we actually do the examination mostly in the form of um, presentations, so oral presentations, which I don't think is that common to be that focused on. Um, but it's a good thing to learn as well. And we have all these um, learning goals and things that we have to fulfill, right? I mean, there are a lot of documents regulating what goes into courses and how we examine students and various things that have to learn along the way. And uh, things like, for instance, academic writing has to be in there somewhere in the program because those are skills that students are supposed to pick up. Um, so as far as examination goes, it's a mix. And, and then again, trying to pace it out in a good way. And we also have typically then uh, this system with uh, seven and a half ECTS, ECTS credits per course, uh, and occasionally bigger courses. And also for the um, master's project, uh, the whole thesis project there for in physics and uh, theoretical physics, these can be uh, spread out across a whole year, even if it's only half a year's worth. So you can, you can do that at half speed, which is very good if you're doing lab work, because it may take some actual clock time to do the things you do. Yeah. Or if you have collaborations with people elsewhere where you're dependent on them, it's good that not everything has to happen within the span of 20 weeks. Mm. Okay, thank you. So I have a question and I'm just going to throw it out there. What happens if I fail an exam? Lotta, you're yeah, smiling. No, no problem. <laughs> there are re-exams and then, then there are other re-exams and then you can do the exam next time the course is given. No problem. You are always allowed to, to do re-exams as often as you like, but of course uh, we advise students to yeah, try not to put it, this in <laughs> yeah, rolling because, I mean, passing the exams the first time it's given, it's usually the best way of passing the total program. Yeah, exactly. And also, but I think many uh, or at least some international students are worried that we're going to kick them out uh, if they fail an exam. But of course, that's not going to happen. Uh, we, we want our students to be successful. Um, so we have a question here. Oh, yeah, sorry. Uh, it's the same person, actually. Can you please comment about diabetes research in Elu, Lund University? I am interested in that area. Uh, um, by, yeah, uh, it's uh, students going to diabetes. They are usually, yeah, that's a medical faculty that do that research. You can do the master's in uh, bioinformatics or biomedicine or molecular genetics, for instance depending on your background and your interest in, in the research area. But the medical faculty do the diabetes research. Yeah. And it's quite, it's one of our, uh, very, one of the strongest uh, research areas, I, I guess, within medicine, uh, diabetes research is, is famous in Lund. Um, so here we have a, a person who did a master's of science in toxicology in the UK. Uh, two years work experience in data analysis, blah, blah, blah. I want to improve my professional knowledge by applying for the bioinformatics program. What are my chances as I now enjoy my newfound career and would want to improve? So uh, an academic background yeah. in toxicology, two, year, two years working experience yep. in data analysis. Yeah, no problem. I mean, that's all uh, taken into account during the selection process, as we also do selection on working or research experiences. Put it up in the summary sheet and uh, upload some kind of uh, work uh, certificate, and then it's no problem. We take it into account. All right, excellent. 
We don't actually have any more active questions now, and it's 10, 10 30 almost, and we're going to wrap up this session. So I would like to just say thank you to all the panelists, Lotta, Dawn, Carl, and Anna Maria, and Ulla, who, who left early. Uh, thanks for joining us here today and sharing your knowledge and information about your programs and departments. Um, I hope we managed to help some prospective students decide on uh, whether or not to apply to learn. We hope they do, and we hope to see you next autumn of course, 2022. Remember to make your applications before January 17 and uh, uh, complete your applications no later than February the 1st, 2022, to have a chance to participate in the selection to programs at Lund University. So, okay, uh, thanks everyone. And I hope to see you again. Thanks, can you all? Bye. Bye. Oj, jag bara Johan. Tack, tack. Maria. Tack så ni har. Hej då. Tack för att ni kom. Ja, mycket bra, Johan. Det funkar ja. mycket, mycket bättre den här gången än förra gången jag var med faktiskt. Du gjorde ett jättebra jobb. Tack ska du ha. Tack jag för håller feedbacken. Med. Ja, det ja. var väldigt, väldigt bra. Okej. Okay. Ja, det de, de kanske får följdfrågor från de studenterna som deltog. Ja. Vi får se hur det blir. Men då, då hänvisar vi till er. Det är mycket bra. Ja. Tack, tack. ska ni ha. Hej då. Hej då. Hej. Hej.